Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! Hello, welcome back to episode 20 of the Japan Archives. So I wanted to do something about more modern history this week. And I wanted to talk about the only Japanese man to have been aboard the Titanic. That is pretty modern in terms of Japanese history. It is history. pretty modern. Is it something you already know anything about? No, I did not know that the, there was a Japanese man on the Titanic. I mean, it, it makes sense because the one of the common means of transportation back in the early part of the 20th century for that as well was boats. Intercontinental uh, boat voyages. Boat voyages. Boat voyages. <laughs> boat voyages. Oh, that makes more sense. Sorry, I misheard. So... The man in question that I want to talk about today was called Masabumi Hosono. He was born in 1870, October 15th, and he lived all the way until March 14th, 1939. We know that he lived out his life being a civil servant, but like I said, what is interesting about his life is that he was a Japanese passenger aboard the Titanic. And before when I said he was the only Japanese man on the ship, he was actually the only Japanese person at all to have ever been on the Titanic. So as we know about the Titanic, it sunk on his maiden voyage. But of course, Mr. Masabumi, he was one of the survivors. He made it onto a lifeboat and he made it all the way safely back home to Japan. A little bit about his life before the sinking of the Titanic. We know that he was born in the village of Hokura, which is in Niigata Prefecture. After he eventually graduated from the Tokyo Higher Commercial School, he found a job with the with Mitsubishi, uh, the Mitsubishi Joint Stock Company, which he stayed with until 1897. So he stayed with it for a, hmm, a good number of years. So he eventually left the job to go be a cargo clerk in Tokyo City, the Shiodome Freight Terminal. During his time here, it seems that he was quite an intelligent man. He also took it upon himself to learn Russian. Oh. And by learning Russian, it eventually led him to working as a railroad director. And as a railroad director, and, and because of his ability to now speak Russian, the company he worked for sent him to Russia and tasked him to undertake research into the modern Russian railway system at the time. So he could potentially bring it and improve on Japan's railway systems. Now, funnily enough, it's because they sent him to Russia that he ended up on the Titanic. He was in Russia and the time came that he was going to return to Japan. On his way back to Japan, so he went from Russia back to London. From London, he ended up in Southampton. And then in Southampton, he boarded on the Titanic on, the, on April 10th, 1912 as a second class passenger. So I'm gonna test your Titanic knowledge. Do you remember the day it hit the iceberg. I really don't. I was going to actually ask you. So it sets off from Southampton on April 10th. I really don't remember. Oh gosh, it's been too long since I've read about the Titanic. Okay, so what happens is the iceberg hits the ship on April 14th. So only four days after its maiden voyage from the Southampton docks. It said that Mr. Masabumi, quite rightly I think, um, found himself fearing for his life as did so many others at the time that this disaster occurred. It said that Mr. Masabumi was awoken by one of the stewards on board during the night, but unfortunately for quite a while he found himself trapped below deck and he wasn't allowed up onto the boat deck from where he could actually board a lifeboat and reach safety. Now from what I can tell, that was because um, the crew at the time believed him to have been a third class passenger and not a second class passenger. Of course, if you remember on the Titanic film, you see parts of it where they're below deck and they actually close the gates in the corridors and the third class passenger corridors. From what I could tell from the research I've done, I think that was more of a artistic licensing for the film itself. There's no proof that this actually occurred to the passengers that were stuck below deck third class passenger section. But the gates did exist on the ship. This was more so that they could be closed so that these passengers couldn't 
have access to different parts of the ship, like the first class and the second class areas. Um, the assumption was that third class passengers were immigrants wanting to travel to America to make a new life, so they were kept separate for fear of spreading disease and things like that, and also kept separate so that once they reached Ellis Island, they could disembark the ship more quickly because they were all held in a different area. And then at Ellis Island, they could undergo the process to becoming um, legal citizens while everyone else would carry on sailing to the main island. But going back to Mr. Masabumi, we know that he eventually does make these people on board the ship realize that he's actually a second class passenger. And so they finally allowed him to go up to the boat deck where all the lifeboats were being dispatched from at the time. Now, as far as I can tell, going back to the third class passengers that he was initially mistaken for. We know that every class aboard the ship had their own separate deck and each different class of passengers had their own allocated lifeboats. Fortunately for the third class passengers, no, uh, none of the lifeboats were stored on their deck and all of the lifeboats were stored above in the first and second class areas, meaning that for the people down in third class, they would have had to go through a maze of corridors to eventually find their way up to the first and second decks, which obviously by that point, because it would have taken them longer to reach the top decks, the chance of them having any lifeboats remaining would have been a lot lower than it would have been for those with the, the better class tickets on. So Mr. Masabumi, he has reached the boat deck and it said that he could see a lot of emergency flares being shot into the air during this time. And he wrote after the events that, uh, in his own words, all the while flares signaling emergency were being shot into the air ceaselessly. And hideous flashes and noises were simply terrifying. Somehow I could in no way dispel the feeling of utter dread and desolation. Now during his time there, uh, on the top decks, he could see all the lifeboats you know, they were, they were leaving quickly as the ship was sinking and all of the lifeboats, as we know, were filled with women and children first. Now, the concept of the women and children first at the time was more of a Western concept than a Japanese concept, but we'll come back to that. So he's, he's seen these lifeboats fill up really quick and eventually he could see the 10th lifeboat. Um, it was almost full. So going back to his writing, he writes that, I found myself looking for and waiting for any possible chance of survival. And as we know, because he survived, he he found a bit of luck, um, considering, of course, how many did lose their lives on the day that the ship sunk. He heard one of the boat crew from this 10th lifeboat shouting that there was room for two more people on board. And so it said Mr. Masabumi saw another man jump in front of him to take one of the seats. And Mr. Masabumi basically says that the example of the first man making a jump led me to take this chance. So basically, he saw a man take the, the one seat, so he boarded onto the 10th lifeboat. Now, he says that after he boarded, no one realized that he was actually a man and not a woman or a child. And that was one reason was because the men in charge of the lifeboat were busy you know, attending to other things like getting this boat to safety. But in addition to that, obviously, it would have been so dark, it was actually very difficult to distinguish between man and woman at the time. The chance of him actually, them realizing that it was actually a man on board ship was a, a very low chance. And yeah, no one actually noticed who he was. Eventually, as we know, the Titanic does sink. His writing says that the lifeboat he was in was filled with the sobbing of mothers and children who feared for both their fathers and their husbands who had remained on board. Now, Mr. Masabumi comments that he was much depressed by all this, as was everyone. And he basically didn't know what was to become of him or anyone else in the long run. And that they basically, and that he hoped that they all reached safety. Now, as we know, all these survivors on the lifeboat were eventually found and rescued by the RMS Carpathia. And it was once he boarded onto the ship that he began writing all these notes about the Titanic. Now, the interesting thing about his notes is that they're special and unique in a way because they are the only known document that we have in existence to have been written on the stationery that was provided by the Titanic. We have nothing else that has survived which was written on Titanic stationery which I think is quite mm. interesting. So but going into what exactly he wrote, firstly he wrote a letter home to his wife in English and secondly he used the time aboard the Carpathia to write to basically write an account in Japanese of his experiences aboard the Titanic and his experiences of what occurred during the sinking of the Titanic. So in the, in the aftermath of everything, little attention was actually given to him 
even though he was a man aboard a lifeboat, and we know that Mr. Masabumi finally began his journey home once they had reached the safety of America. And he went from New York all the way to San Francisco, and during his time in San Francisco, that was where he found a ship which took him back to Japan. We know that a local newspaper at the time finally got a hold of the story and dubbed him as the lucky Japanese boy of the Titanic and he even found himself being asked to undertake interviews for several different newspapers and magazines and there was even one called the Yomi Uri Shimbun which even asked for a photo of him and his family to place in the newspaper as he was the Japanese survivor of the Titanic. So what do you think Heather happened to him in the long run after this? Do you think he was praised for his survival or do you think there was some backlash backlash like i feel like based on my knowledge of japanese culture that perhaps for him to have escaped and not stay to help or fight or persevere uh, might not have been seen as a good thing yes you're right unfortunately all of this good news all of this Perhaps fame is the wrong word, but like the fame he had from being on all these newspapers and things, um, it eventually backfired. So around the same time as the release of the Titanic film, actually, an article was released which delved into a bit more of Mr. Masabumi and the aftermath of his survival. And the article said that eventually he found himself being publicly condemned for his actions. He was described as a stowaway by some and some of the men who were in charge of the lifeboat said that the only way he could have gotten on board of their ship was if he had actually disguised himself as a woman. But I would like to say that that particular aspect of the story was never reported in Japan, it was only reported abroad, and as Mr. Masabumi wrote in his own writings that it was so dark upon the boat it would have been difficult to see what well, to differentiate between any man or woman on board anyway. Because of all this fallout he sadly lost his job, and was deemed a coward by the Japanese press. This article we're talking about also stated that the Japanese even published school textbooks which used him as an example of how dishonorable he was and how you shouldn't do dishonorable acts. And it even became so bad that he was denounced as an immoral person by a professor of ethics. To redeem him a little, in 2007 someone undertook some research, uh, a man by the name of Ando Kenji, and he does state that he was unable to find any old school textbooks which did actually condemn him in this way. So whether it was, whether it occurred and then the textbooks were hidden or destroyed, or whether it was a sensational eyes topic to get more readership, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, at least in one aspect, research undertaken in 2007 does say that this probably never happened and I would like to think it didn't. I don't like the idea of the Japanese Board of Education using a man who survived such a horrible event, using him as an example of someone who's dishonest. I kind of don't like that. <laughs> um, You've given me so much information right now that I'm still trying to process everything. Um, yeah, I think even back around this the turn of the century, I think think even among like American and in European cultures and English cultures that it would have been seen as a more dishonorable thing to have done to have taken possibly taken the place of you know oh another woman or child or I know I read a story I can't I don't know if this is a true story or a it was one of the speeches my students did one of my speech contests about the woman who a teacher a school teacher uh, on the okay. titanic who gave up her seat because she had no family she wasn't married she was single and then she perished on the titanic so you know for him to have taken the place of someone else you know especially because men and like the men were supposed to protect the women and children and for him to jump jump into the ship yeah i think even back then would have been seen as not quite honorable i think in in many cultures around that time but to to like not save face i think like he um is that there was the right term i think so yeah to not act honorably would have been yeah not 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 recommended so it's kind of i kind of wonder how he felt too like afterwards like if he then eventually like 
condemned himself for surviving when other people did not. I know a lot of a lot of survivors go through that survivor's guilt. And for him too to realize maybe after, like not just like having the public condemnation, but what was his internal feelings? Like I, I imagine it's hard to process that post-traumatic stress as well as the public condemnation as well. So that poor man must have really gone through quite a lot. Yeah, I agree. You have to consider going back to what I said, the whole concept of the women and children first. There are a few academics who have, after reading this article, they put a they tried to put a few explanations forward about why he received such a hostile reaction to all of this. Some have said it's the concept of like he betrayed the spirit of the samurai and that the whole self-sacrifice element of Japanese culture. But there's also the suggestion that he failed, he basically failed to conform to what was expected in that he was supposed to sacrifice himself for women and children but actually he selfishly pushed that aside to save himself. And, and because of this he was subjected to, I think in Japanese it's called like murahachibu or like ostracism. But then there is a woman called Margaret Mel and she attributes, attributes this ostracism to the perception that it wasn't that he didn't conform to the culture of Japan because in Japanese culture the concept of women and children first wasn't really a thing. It was more that he embarrassed Japan by not following the protocols of Western culture which because Japan at this time was trying to open up to the world and show they were just as good as everyone else, because he didn't follow the cultures of the Western world which they were now trying to adopt, he embarrassed their, cult their country in that regard. Mm. So it's very interesting to think of it in that way, in that yes, he did nothing to dishonor the actual culture of Japan, what he actually did instead, he, was, he embarrassed his whole country by not following the cultures of other countries, which Japan was now trying to begin to integrate into being, yeah. Yeah, but the interesting thing is, I mean, he was probably thinking about his family at the time, like he didn't, he wanted to take care of his family as well. So, I mean, he had a family back in Japan that he hadn't seen for a long, long time. And then maybe they have, would have had no way of knowing that he died there. I mean, well, I mean, I'm assuming the, the logs of the travelers would have been published after the fact too, but still, you know, there was no way of knowing possibly that at the time when all that was going on, because yeah, I remember it was cold and dark and it's just, it was, that was really, it was all tough. Exactly. So yes, on there's also the idea that obviously that there were other men that did survive the sinking of the Titanic treated with the same ostracism. Again, it was probably that all men were treated the same way and they didn't pick and choose between different cultures. Like, you were a man who survived when you shouldn't have. You're all the same. You all deserve the same persecution in a way. And it's kind of sad because Mr. Uh, so Mr. Masabumi basically lived out the rest of his life with this being a source of shame for not only him but also his family and he never actually spoke of it himself apart from the initial interviews and obviously the letter he wrote to his wife but apart from that he never actively spoke about it ever again. It wasn't until like after the Titanic film had actually been released that people realized more of the truth behind the Titanic and then like all was forgiven in a way, which was good because finally at this point, like he had grandchildren and they were all relieved that honor had finally been able to be restored to their family because of, funnily enough, the James Cameron film, which helped clear his name in some way. So there is a happy ending in a way to that, but we do know as well that before he died, he was luckily re-employed into his old job, um, even though he had been fired for basically saving his life. But it's highly likely that they re-employed him because they knew that he was too too valuable a person to lose. He was intelligent, he could speak Russian and all those things we said before. This company did actually employ him for the rest of his life and he worked there until the day he died. A happy ending in a way in that he did get his job back and also yeah, his family eventually got their honor restored even if it was because of James Cameron's Titanic film. Wow, well, I am I am really glad you found that story. I I had no idea. I yeah, um I had no idea that there like I, yeah, I mean there were knew there was other nationalities on board, but I had no idea that that's a long trip too from Japan to Russia to London across America to Japan. That's amazing. How long did that take? Oh my gosh, like back in the in the night in the 1900s, that that's weeks, months. 
Well, thank you, Thomas. That I learned definitely learned something new today and it's really fascinating and thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But yeah, I'm glad you liked it. I'm looking forward to today's poem. Well, today's poet is Fujiwara no Tarahira. We have another Fujiwara. And this uh, Tarahira-san was born in 880 and died in 949. So he was active during the Heian period. And he was a high rank noble. Okay. And Thomas, I think you recognize this name. I did recognize the name. I've read about him before. He's already on the website because I was doing some research into some old Japanese literature and I found out that he was one of the ones who wrote it basically. And so I know a little bit about him. I know a little bit behind like some of the things he wrote during his lifetime, but this is your section, not mine. So take it away. Well, yes, he was famous for writing or what? Well, maybe not famous is the right word, but he was known for writing the Ingashiki, hmm. which is a book of Japanese laws and customs. Now, his brother actually Takahira, uh, Tokihira his brother Tokihira began the work but he died in 909 and so his brother Tarahira finished the work in 927 mm. so today's poem are you ready I have my pen I am ready Oguriyama mine no momiji ba kokoro araba ima hito tabi no miyuki matanai okay so I think I had three words today excellent so what did you hear today um I'm not sure what the name was, but I heard Yama, but I didn't hear the name of the mountain. Mm. Um, I heard Momiji. Mm. Um, Momiji being like the autumn leaves. And the last one I heard was Kokoro, so heart. Mm. But yeah, only three words today. Hey, that was really good. Um, so the translation is, Dear Maples of Mount Ogura, if you have a heart... Please wait for another visit so that his majesty may enjoy your lovely autumn colors. Oh. So Mount Ogura is located northwest Kyoto, uh, which is, I think, you know, probably very famous for the autumn colors. So right now it should be, I think, really pretty right now. Uh, I know I saw on something on television yesterday about Nara right now. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and, you know, and in spring, Hanami is really popular, but also in Aki, which is the word for fall or autumn, as I have been informed by some other people that is also should be used. <laughs> um, that That is also a really popular time to go and traveling and no different back in the uh, early Heian period <laughs> that uh, Japanese people would, or the nobles, usually people who had a little bit more traveling money would go to the different beauty spots to see the changing of the leaves, to write poetry, uh, to view not just Hanami, but also to view the autumn leaves. Japan has a lot of momiji, which are maples. So they are, there are certain species of maples that are indigenous to I think Japan and I think Korea and China as well and some of the colors are just absolutely vibrant and amazing and even now where I live is kind of more in a valley the mountains that are surrounding us the leaves are really starting to change now so there's a lot of oranges and reds and it's really lovely like spring is beautiful summer is beautiful fall also is quite beautiful uh, winter is cold, um, <laughs> but there's, there's good food, so that makes up for it. And kotatsu. Um, and so this po this poem poem <laughs> this poem comes from Thomas. Can you guess where my poem is from today? I'm gonna guess our good friend the uh, 100 poet. It is indeed. But something I just kind of found out recently, which I really should have known earlier. I probably read, but I probably forgot. Uh, did you know that there is a there is a card game. The karuta is, uh, there is one that's based on the, um, there is a card game version of the 100 poems. Do you know when the card game version of the Hyaku Ishin came out? I don't actually. But no, I know Karuta itself has been around for a while, but I'm not sure when the first instance of this one came out. Edo period, because printing technology was more available. Oh, that makes sense. They printed the picture and a picture. They printed a picture and put the poem on the card as well. There is also competitive tournaments, and in January 
There's a national championship held at the Omi Shrine in Otsu City, and male and female players are chosen. And there's also high school championships. There is, uh, I don't know if you've heard this, I've, re I've heard this manga, I'm going to mangle the name very badly. Chiha Yafura. Chiha Yahuru. Chiha Ah, uh, it's not one I have heard of. It's a, it's a manga, anime, and film. It is about a girl who plays Karuta competitively. So that's why I, I really did choose, I chose today because it is autumn, it is fall. And oh, where I live in Hiroshima Ken, Momiji Manju are very popular. And Momiji Manju are usually red bean paste in a soft shell. So it's not, it's not like mochi. It's more of like a, almost like a bread or like kind of pancake type texture and they're delightful and you can also get them deep fried, which are also really delightful. Oh, that does sound good. I was going to ask a question about the poem actually. Oh, excellent. Um, it's set in the season of autumn, but obviously the line where you said that, so that his majesty may enjoy your lovely autumn colors. Is there a story behind that? part of the poem? Like why is he asking them to wait one more time for his majesty's visit? So he went with the retired emperor and because it was so beautiful he wanted the current emperor to also come so they were like wait wait you gotta wait for the emperor to come look this is the older emperor now you need the the current one to take a look as well so that's kind of oh so he was writing it saying I'm gonna come back and so he's not he wasn't saying I'm coming back next year. He's saying, I'm coming back soon. I need you to hold on to your autumn colors for like a few weeks longer. Mm, which I, I was doing a little bit of research and I think it's around, is it around 20 days? Like the colors here last for a good, you know, a little over two weeks. So he, he is very possible he might have made it, might not have made it, but it is kind of rare though that he talked to the trees as if they were like people. Like, hey, can you just wait? Please don't. Instead of addressing nature, he addresses nature as another person. Mm. Well, I think it's, I think it would make sense in the context of the poem, like there is no person to address. So he, he needs to personally address the the trees themselves and implore them to hold on to their autumn beauty until he can basically return. So you said um, the, Mom the Momiji lasts for about 20 days or so, um, assuming the Edo period, a time before modern technology. Um, so the walking itself from Mount Ogura to Tokyo would have taken around 38 hours. So I think it would have been entirely possible that he could have returned in time, assuming he wrote the poem at the beginning of the season as opposed to towards the end. Mm, yeah, yeah. It could, but you, I mean, you have to imagine that, like the because back during this time, there weren't quite as many cities and towns and things built up. Just even the journey to get there was probably absolutely beautiful. Yeah, that's true. So that's my poem for today. You have any other question? No, I don't think I do. I just had the one question about the emperor, but you explained everything else. <gasps> oh. It was good. It was a nice. It was. It was a nice poem. Uh, I've I've yet to find a poem in that book that we haven't liked. Mm. So, but then again, it it was supposed to be a a collection of some of the best poets and poems. So it makes sense in that regard. But yeah, thank you for the poem. But yeah, I have no more questions unless you have thought of now that you've processed some more about the Titanic. I think I'm good for now. If that's everything me and everything from you, shall we say our goodbyes for today? Let's do it. All right. Well, again, thank you everyone for tuning in this week. And we look forward to you coming back next week. So until then, that's everything from me. So bye, guys. Matane. If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at nexus underscore travels. That's N-E-X-U-S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. 
If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Matane.